Well, for most of the rest of the service today, we're going to think a little bit about what it means to be waiting patiently. That's what we heard Paul say in Romans 8. We live with this longing for what God will yet do, the, the future that has been given to us on promise through Jesus Christ that we anticipate already now through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says that while we wait for this, we can wait patiently because God can be trusted to bring about that which God has promised. But waiting patiently can be quite difficult. We've been acknowledging that throughout this summer as we read Paul's letter to the Philippians. We've acknowledged the challenges that they have been living with. We've had the cross before us all summer with these chains. The cross reminding us that Jesus faced severe opposition as he came as God in the flesh, embodying the will of God for all of creation, for human beings, and he was put to death on a cross. God startled everybody, of course, by raising Jesus from the dead and, and seating him at his right hand as, as Lord of all. Paul has heard this good news and he has, he has received it and embraced it and has gone about as a herald of it, announcing it. And as a result, Paul has found himself in chains, bound, put in prison. And we've caught word that the Philippians have begun to experience some of this same opposition as they live under the threats of their neighbors. Waiting patiently can be a real challenge. While we're aware of the goodness of creation that endures and that we taste and enjoy, and while we're anticipating the fullness of God's redemptive work when Jesus Christ returns and all is made new, waiting patiently is often difficult. Sometimes it's severe opposition on account of our faith in Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's enduring the hard reality of the ongoing presence of death. And we know that through Jesus Christ, we belong to God in life and in death. Nothing can separate us from God's love, and yet we grieve the loss of our loved ones. So just this past week as a congregation, we we acknowledge the passing of Marty Prince, the tenth person from our congregation who has passed away just this year. And we rehearse again the, the movements of sadness, of grief, of receiving comfort, of anticipating the fullness of what God will yet do. But that can be a tiring thing to live with this ongoing reality of death. It's so present. And when loved ones and friends are, are taken from us, uh, a hard thing to endure. We're facing a fall right now. This simple image might provoke some anxiety as well. It's back to school time. There's a level of enthusiasm, but this year it's back to school with these masks. We don't like that reality. We don't like the thought as students of maybe having to wear these things all day while we're at school or at least in the hallways and in the bathrooms. It's a, it's a constant reminder that we're living with the presence of this disease that has uprooted so much of our routines. The presence of a mask reminds us too, maybe it gets us thinking about, well, how's this actually going to go in the classroom? Is it going to prove to be complicating? What if things get too complicated and the decision is made that students well, they need to learn at home full time for a stretch again. Uh, we live with this uncertainty and so a simple image like a backpack with a mask can, can make it very difficult for us to wait patiently for the future that God has promised. And then as if we needed any more reminders of how difficult it can be to wait patiently as joyful witnesses of the Lord Jesus, we anticipate an election season that's proving, uh, promising to be intense. There will be hard conversations, there will be strong opinions voiced, and yet in the midst of it, we're, we're called to wait patiently, to, to live as joyful witnesses. And yet, when we think of all of the hard realities, that can weigh in on us. We actually feel it in our bodies, we feel it in our, in our heads as we feel the stress of it weighing down. We can feel it in our chests as they tighten, as our hearts beat, as our breaths quicken. And yet Paul says, wait patiently. The discipline, and much of it we find, depends on where we place our attention, where we're tuned into, at our core beliefs. 
And so we're perhaps surprised that as Paul lands, uh, begins to land the plane of this letter, as he brings it to a conclusion, he comes to a series of commands that surprise us. While sitting in prison, while acknowledging the realities that the Philippians face, he ends with a series of commands that feel so entirely life-giving, marked by peace, joy, that set us on a trajectory of being creative participants in this wondrous world that God has created. It seems, sometimes, like a high bar to reach. And yet Paul writes from his knowledge of the unseen reality, the presence of God, that allows him to write what he does and to live as he does. So we're going to consider this morning some very familiar verses, Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. And then we're going to consider again what Paul is urging us to live into as those who belong to Jesus Christ. So hear these words from Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. Think about these things. And whatever you have learned from me, or received from me, or heard from me, or seen in me, put these things into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Apostle Paul, through Jesus Christ, came to find, maybe much to his surprise, that the Creator God, whose life is marked by peace, whose whole project and work results in peace, well-being, wholeness, harmony for all of creation is ever attentive to this world, is ever attentive to his project of redemption, can be communed with now and makes his peace accessible. This is the unseen reality that governs the Apostle Paul's life and which he sets before us again to behold with eyes of faith so that we might know the same peace that Paul knows. We pause first to simply acknowledge our gratitude, our awe, at the fact that the very life of God, our Creator, is marked by peace. Paul says, the peace of God and the God of peace. That's good news. That at the very heart of reality, the one who spoke it into being, his life is marked by peace, by a calmness, by a serenity, by a delight in well-being. This is the God who created all that is. And then Paul has come to find that through Jesus Christ, God made flesh, who suffered and died for us, but who is raised to life as Lord of all. Through this Jesus, the peace of God is enjoyed. And this peace of God actually guards his mind and his heart in the midst of trying and difficult circumstances. And it allows Paul to live with a sense of 
peace and calm as he waits for the fullness of what God will yet do. I wonder if we think about it like this for a moment. I suspect that most of us find that at some point we long for the way things were. Biblically speaking, we long for Eden, for that wondrous garden where Adam and Eve lived in fellowship with one another and with God and where all was well and they were set in a wondrous setting as caretakers to tend to it, to bring about the wondrousness and the delights of all that God has made as caretakers. There wasn't disruption, there wasn't disintegration, there wasn't death, there wasn't hostility. I have a sense that we long for that. When we have the taste that we acknowledged earlier in the service, the, the awe of what God has made, the fellowship of one another, the delight of the creatures of God and, and the trees and the flowers and all that God has brought into being, and we have a sense for all that is right and things feel so so right and we can't help but give thanks to God, we perhaps live with a sense that oh, we'd like to go back to that time when that was all that marked life. We can't, of course. That's in the past. Much has transpired since then. So now we set our attention on the future. That's Romans 8. And with thanks to God, we can long, hopefully, confidently, for that future where, where that beginning rest is, well, it's, it's enjoyed again. All is well. And we long for that. But we find ourselves between the two ends, the beginning and the end. And, and the Bible speaks in ways that get us thinking about how in between always feels like a wilderness. It's hot. It's taxing. It's marked by animosity, hostility, and the reality of death. And yet Paul is speaking here in such a way that tunes us into the reality that the God who created all things very good in the beginning and the God who will recreate in the end is present and accessible now in the present, in the wilderness. That's astonishing. But it's what governs Paul's life. And it helps us make sense of this passage. That's why he can say, rejoice. And I say it again, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Not in present circumstances, because all is not well in the moment. But rejoice in the Lord, in Jesus, uh, the one who came from heaven. God in the flesh, taking our sin upon himself, going to the cross, now raised as Lord, the conqueror of death, the one who stands sovereign over all of the chaos and all of the disruption of life. Rejoice in the Lord, the one who is coming again. And when he does, by the power that allows him to bring all things under his control, will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. Rejoice in the Lord. What God has begun cannot be stopped or undone. Rejoice in the Lord. That's why Paul goes on then to speak of letting our gentleness be made known to all. Gentleness, a, a kindly disposition, a, an attitude of heart and mind that, that prompts us to live as, not as sore winners, but as kind, gracious victors. As those who see the damage, the wreckage, the pain of this world and respond with tears. As Paul did. We heard that in chapter 3. Uh, he notes those who live as enemies of the cross of Christ, but he, he writes that with tears. As those who have a hope and a future, assured of our communion with God right now, we live gently responding to the world with an insistence, but always with an attitude to bless, to love, to serve, to promote, to invite others in. Responding to evil with love even, as Jesus and Paul and the entire scriptures would have us do. Paul knows that that's a high calling. That's an arduous, challenging calling. And yet, Paul reminds us, we can do this because he says the Lord is near. Uh, the one who will come back to bring all things under his control, he's near. His return is very soon. So we can stand our ground living gently, vulnerable, confident that the Lord Jesus will certainly return any moment. And when he does, he will make 
all things new. Then Paul speaks of not being anxious, and we're going to come back to that one because that's the one we perhaps struggle with the most. And then Paul sets us on a trajectory in verses 8 and 9. All that is, well, you heard the list, all that is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Take note of them. Ponder them. That's a really lovely way to live. And then he speaks of his own example, the one who has embodied before them the way of Jesus, embracing suffering love for the sake of those around him. Put it all into practice. It's a call of sorts to live as we were created to live, as human beings made in the image of God, now being remade in the image of Jesus Christ. To live with enthusiasm, with generosity, to bless, to serve. It gets me thinking about how followers of Jesus ought to be known as those who are quick to affirm the goodness of life and to express our appreciation for it wherever we see it and whoever brings it about. Sometimes Christians are known as harsh individuals who, who say, no, 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 that's not really who we are. And that's not who Paul is calling us to be. Paul uses a word in there, the word lovely, that, that is an appreciative response to aesthetic beauty, a painting, a landscape, a, a symphony, something that delights our senses. Paul says, take note of that, think of that, and it gets us thinking about, well, what is right? What is good? What satisfies in a way that is in line with God's intentions for this world? Think about those things, affirm those things. Isn't that a wondrous way to live? That we've been per given permission, the freedom to pursue this way of life with gladness and delight, to seek the well-being of those around us in community and neighborhoods around the world, confident that this is the way of life that holds. Constantly inviting others in through Jesus Christ that they might participate fully with us in communion with God. It's a wondrous trajectory that Paul sets us on as he brings this letter to a close. And it all sounds well and good except for all that which troubles us, all that we named already. So it's really something that that command we stepped over briefly is one that we should take note of. Where Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Now, I think in context, what Paul is probably uh, has at the forefront of his mind is the opposition that the Philippian Christians are facing due to their allegiance to Jesus Christ, living in a Roman colony where people are seeking to protect peace and order, and Christians seem to be a threat to that. Because what if some in Philippi don't pledge allegiance to Caesar? And what if word gets back to Rome? Then what about the privileges that the city of Philippi enjoys? And I suspect there's something in that dynamic that has the, the neighbors of these Philippian Christians looking in on them suspiciously, suspiciously, turning up the heat a bit so that they might fall back in line as those who will give thanks to Caesar and to Rome along with them. I think that's principally what Paul has in mind when he says, do not be anxious about anything. But we, we should note that Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. There's so many concerns that we carry with us. We've acknowledged a number of them already today. Undoubtedly, that brings more to mind. And the natural tendency is to put all sorts of attention and energy into securing ourselves, guarding against threats, either real or perceived, so that we might find ourselves secure, that we might find a little breathing space. It's a natural tendency. And yet Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Rather, and this is where we need to focus a little attention, rather, he says, all that concerns you, all that weighs upon you, all that seems to be a threat to you, bring it all before God with thanksgiving in your hearts. Turn those cares, those concerns, those worries, those threatening circumstances, turn them into prayers. Bring them before God. And here's the stunning promise. The peace of God. 
the peace that marks the life of God himself will guard your hearts and your minds. Flip those. Your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Isn't that something? The word guards would have stood out to the Philippians. There was a garrison, a contingency of Roman soldiers around Philippi to, to guard the peace of the city, to guard the order of the city. Those who were going to disrupt it, they were going to be held accountable. So there's an external force that guards uh, an outworking of peace and order according to the way of Rome. Paul's playing off that word, and he speaks of a peace that cannot be threatened in the life of God, the very peace of God that simply is, that simply endures, that simply marks the life of God. This peace now guards hearts and minds in Christ Jesus in the midst of whatever circumstance might be present. I'll admit, this past spring, when everything with COVID was ramping up and things were shutting down and there was really no telling how this was going to go and what was going to happen, it was a stressful time. And I would read the news and I would see the numbers and I would see the pictures and hear the threats of it all and wonder about what this means for school and for the economy and, and for all sorts of things. And it would feel like all of my creative energy was just getting sapped and shrunk and it was easy to be anxious and overly concerned. So I tried to stay in a routine of getting up early and reading scripture and praying and bringing it before God. And I actually experienced something that I wasn't sure I would experience during that time. That with all of that swirling about, with all sorts of uncertainty, I found that after engaging in that time of scripture and prayer and bringing it all before God, the one who holds our lives, I had a sense that my mind had been freed, that I could get on with the work of the day, that I even had bursts of creativity that I was pretty sure I wouldn't have during that season. I was surprised by it. Paul would say, why are you surprised? That's what I'm talking about. But sometimes that can be surprising to realize that the peace of God is actually that present, that near, because of God's goodness and care for us. And he secures our lives and he settles our hearts and he settles our minds in the midst of circumstances and he allows us to carry on and he compels us through the Holy Spirit to get on with love, joy, peace, and seeking the well-being of one another. Now, it's the promise that Paul speaks. That doesn't mean it's going to be automatic. It doesn't mean that there's a simple formula. But Paul speaks to the counted onness of this that we should assume that God is this near, that when we bring him our prayers, our concerns with thanksgiving, when we entrust ourselves to God, we will find that God is so good and guarding our hearts and our minds with the peace that marks his very life. And we'll know that we're okay. And that in the midst of whatever circumstances we're facing, God will be with us. The God of peace will be with us. And we'll be able to face even the harsh realities with the confidence of knowing that the future for which we long is coming. And we can actually then wait for it patiently. So here's what I'm going to encourage you to do today. To practice this. To note the cares, the concerns that you carry with you right now, whatever they may be, whatever your circumstances are, whatever seems to be a threat to you, you, to your family, to this community, real or perceived, name it. Write a list. But as you're writing that list, write down another list. Things for which you are quick to give thanks to God for the wonders of his creation, for the presence of people in your life that encourage and affirm and support you, for the forgiveness of sins that is ours already through Jesus Christ, for the promises that allow us to live with a hope and anticipation of a very good future. Write that list down too. And once you have those lists, spend some time with it, and then bring that before God in a prayer. Give it some time. Don't feel as though you need to rush and allow God to be near you, 
rest in the presence of God and expect, even if it's just a touch, of the peace of God to fill your heart and your mind. And then make this a regular practice, given all of the cares and concerns that we carry with us, that we bring it all before God, the creator of Eden, the one who will bring about Eden restored, the one who is with us in this wilderness even now, who longs to guard our hearts and our minds with his very peace and assures us that he is with us. Might we find ourselves ever living into seeking this reality that Paul names, that he lives from, that allowed him to live in chains, in prison, and yet carry on in rejoicing? Let's find ways of seeking that posture, that practice, in anticipation of the peace of God being known right now and in anticipation of the return of the Lord Jesus when all will be made new and our longings will be fully met. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we do give you thanks and praise for you are very good. You are loving and sovereign and kind and you draw near to us. Thank you. We do hold before you today cares and concerns, the loss of loved ones, of Marty Prince, of a sister-in-law of Betty Morin. We hold before you the uncertainty that some of us are facing going into a, a week that marks the beginning of a school year as teachers, as parents, as students. How's this going to go? What's this going to look like? Will we be okay? Lord, we hold these concerns before you. We think about a fall where we're anticipating a national election, but the atmosphere is tense. It's marked by hostilities. And we wonder how to give glad testimony to the reign of the Lord Jesus even in the midst of this. Lord, there's the ongoing presence of a disease and we're waiting for the eradication of it. We're waiting for healing. We're, re we're waiting for a vaccine, for, for treatments. And that gives us pause and it can create anxiety within us. So God, we bring all of this before you and many other things. Grateful that you care. Grateful that you are attentive to our cries. Grateful that you did not create us to live with anxiety, but with peace. And we pray that we would know of your peace, that it would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And that living from your peace, that we would find that we are set free from worry, from anxiety, to pursue the vastness of the goodness of life that you have created us to tend to. We pray that our witness would be noted, that it would be marked with thanks, that others would be intrigued, that they would long to join us in this as followers of Jesus, to your honor and to your glory. So hear our prayers, O oh God. Bless us with your peace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close today with a doxology of sorts that helps us close with praise the way we began with praise. But before we sing, would you receive God's blessing? So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen.